Okay, so the fourth lecture would be on the uh, political ecology of water. And if you remember, I uh, covered socio hydrology as an emerging uh, framework uh, which had been you know conceptualized and being pursued by the hydrologists or mainly you know the natural scientists. Uh, so, and I mentioned that you know there are two major uh, very interesting uh, emerging theoretical frameworks today. So, one is the socio uh, hydrology being pursued by the natural scientists and the other one is hydro social which is being pursued mainly by the social scientists. So, uh, now uh, before we understand or before we move on to uh, hydro social or the hydro social cycle or hydro sociality, it is important for us to understand political ecology of water, what political ecology of water is all about. This is very important because this is the umbrella concept, this is the umbrella approach or framework from where hydro sociality or the hydro social cycle had actually emerged. So, before we cover hydro sociality, before we understand what hydro social cycle is all about, it is very important for us to understand political ecology of water, which is the crux of lecture 4. Now, the first question uh, you know uh, so far as the water sector is concerned today is why water crisis is taking place. So, uh, is it due to the natural factors like uh, climate change um, or is it you know uh, human induced or then we can complicate the whole question by even saying that whether sometimes you know natural uh, variables or the natural factors are also loaded with anthropogenic uh, influence. So, these are the questions, these are the critical or complex questions that we really need to raise and really need to understand to understand and perceive uh, deeply perceive water crisis or water scarcity. So, there is a very interesting article written by Barbara Rose Johnston and the name of the article is political ecology of water which he published in 2003 uh, in uh, the very famous uh, journal called uh, capitalism nature and socialism and there Barbara uh, Rose Johnston uh, says that you know. Uh, Today, there is a kind of a complicated contradiction between agendas and action that value water as a fundamental human right and agendas and actions that value water as a private commodity. So, this clash is very much evident and due to this particular clash, he, uh, Rose argues that we are not being able to come up with possible solutions and we are even not being able, uh, I mean we are not being in a position to avoid a new crisis or emerging water crisis. So, this brings us to another uh, very important question that is scarcity real or manufactured or even manipulated at times. Now, what do we mean by whether scarcity is real or manufactured? So, the idea is like uh, in some of the mainstream discourses you will find that scarcity is explained only in terms of non availability or lack of availability of resources. But the question is, is scarcity only lack of availability? If we say that scarcity is only unavailability of resources, then actually we are not applying the political lens. So, it is a very kind of a linear apolitical uh, explanation uh, of scarcity that scarcity is nothing but you know a lack of availability. So, we will go deeper to understand the you know deeper and inner meanings or the multiple layers uh, that are uh, very much there that are embedded in the entire issue of scarcity be it water resource be it any other natural resources. So, this again brings us to the uh, idea that you know the issue of water is uh, are not only issues relating to or issues of quantity and quality, but it is also the issue of access and also the various variables and parameters that are at play that are at work that determine access and entitlement to water resources. So, the other day uh, if you remember in the introductory uh, lecture, I discussed about uh, the uneven uh, entitlement 
to water resources in the particular city of Kolkata. So where we found that you know uh, in Kolkata in the slums and in squatters, uh, uh, the people they uh, they uh, they are only entitled to uh, even sometimes less than 50 liters of water drinking water per day. On the other hand, the elite people living in the central parts of the city, for example, the central business districts and all that, they can consume uh, water up to like 150 uh, uh, liters. So, there is a huge uh, difference uh, between uh, the level of consumption between the so called water rich and the so called water poor people. So, on the other hand, if we look into the rural sector, then also we will find that on one hand, while the farmers they are starving, they are suffering from lack of entitlement or lack of access to water resource for uh, for irrigating their fields or you know for some other basic requirements of livelihood on the other hand the uh, private corporations they are being able to buy water at extremely cheap and affordable prices even sometimes 5 paisa per liter so these problem it has come out wonderfully in uh, this particular book by uh, Vandana Shiva, uh, the book called Water Wars, Privatization, Pollution and Profit, which was published in uh, 2002. And there Vandana Shiva writes, she say, says that while you know deserts, while, while on the one hand we find droughts and uh, desertification, these are intensifying around the globe. On the other hand, you know the the uh, the corporations, uh, the private uh, corporate capitalists, they are aggressively transforming uh, free flowing water into bottle profits. So she says that you know these water was uh, in this particular century, the water was would match the oil wars, or even there's a chance that it would surpass the oil wars uh, on the previous century. So, uh, so she also makes us aware of, uh, uh, I mean, the historical erosion and corrosion of uh, community or communal water rights and uh, the emergence of corporate culture. So, she says that uh, the need of the hour is that we really, so she actually calls for a movement. So, a movement that will ensure uh, equal water access to all. And uh, she also evolves at a blueprint of global, resi uh, global resistance, where she draws examples, successful uh, examples uh, of you know successful campaigns uh, across the world, uh, especially also in focusing on India. What is happening in India? How uh, some of the activists they are also. Uh, successfully being able to cr create a lot of pressure, they are being able to pressurize the corporations and the corporate lobby. So, with this background, uh, I will say that political ecology of water is uh, a very important uh, and exciting and a viable framework that makes us aware of the unequal and uneven distribution of water. So, uneven distribution of water across class, caste, ethnicity, gender and spatial lines. So, political ecology of uh, water is uh, that particular lens, that important lens that help us capture complexities and uh, you know non-linearities in the human nature or more specifically human water cyclical interactions. So now, before we move on to political ecology of water, it is very important for us to understand what political ecology is all about. And uh, so, so, so we get an opportunity to learn uh, political ecology before we move uh, into political ecology of water. Uh, so political ecology is a field of critical research uh, that assumes that any tag on the strands of the global wave of human environment linkages it reverberates through the system as a whole. So, if there is any tug on the strands of this entire you know this global wave of human environment linkage, then it would reverberate throughout the system as a whole. Moreover, political ecology it is uh, it, it is uh, it does not uh, comprise of methods and methodologies from a particular discipline, but it combines methods and methods of different disciplines of social sciences mainly you know and so the initiative or the, so, so the inter venture is interdisciplinary. So, and uh, Paul Robbins in this particular book, so Paul Robbins had written this book uh, called Political Ecology, a critical introduction. And in this book, Paul Robbins says that political ecology is not even a discipline, but it is actually a community of practice. 
So, where people coming from various disciplinary backgrounds, uh, they are you know they are pursuing political ecology, but at the same time they are actually raising similar sets of queries across the relationship uh, you know among uh, politics, economics, and ecology. And Paul Robin also says that you know uh, he says that uh, political ecology it uh, presents the Jekyll and Hyde persona. You, uh, I hope you know the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with uh, you know this personalities or split personality disaster, uh, disorder. So he says that you know it represents uh, uh, this Jekyll and Hyde uh, persona because at the same time it provides both the hatchet and the seed. So what uh, is done with this hatchet. So, political ecology it offers the hatchet to take apart lopsided and linear and faulty and politically problematic you know uh, accounts of environmental change or environmental crisis which we will elaborate in our next slide. So, on one hand it takes apart, uh, it offers the hatchet to take apart this particularly problematic accounts or mainstream accounts of environmental change or environmental crisis. On the other hand it also offers the seed, the seed uh, to sow you know uh, new alternative socio -ecologies. So, in that sense it is very comprehensive in this, in that sense it is uh, inclusive and also extremely radical uh, branch of uh, I do not know social science, but maybe you know, some, some, I mean uh, as uh, Paul Robin says that it is not a discipline, but a community of practice. So, it is being pursued not only by academicians, but anybody and everybody under the sun can actually pursue political ecology. Yes, so we need to understand Malthus we need to understand uh, his proposition in this particular book, uh, which of course had its uh, you know long drawn implications and legacy uh, on academics and also on policy circles. Uh, and we also need to know about uh, the entire theory of you know uh, eco scarcity. So, we need to know about uh, eco scarcity and uh, we need to know about uh, Malthusian understanding of environmental change. So, it uh, uh, I mean the argument is quite straightforward. So, the argument is that uh, the when the numbers of human population or when human population absolute numbers would increase that would definitely create a whole lot of stress on the uh, environment because if that exceeds if the uh, if the human population exceeds uh, uh, environmental capacity, then that would be problematic uh, for both the environment and human beings. Because uh, environment the natural asset assets will be extracted and it will be over uh, exploited. So, uh, and uh, most of these natural assets uh, they are um, you know they are not uh, they cannot be uh, renewed. So, uh, so, so they are non renewable. So, uh, so what would happen is that this uh, natural uh, assets uh, would be gone. So, that would be problematic for the survival and sustenance of human beings as well, because uh, that would lead to human starvation and that would also lead to disease uh, based or you know uh, disease uh, uh, related mortality. So, this is uh, the theory of eco scarcity all about where eco scarcity is uh, absolutely explained in terms of population growth in absolute numbers. Now, the whole question is that uh, is this a comprehensive perspective? the answer is straightforwardly no, because like uh, you know uh, if we uh, get influenced by eco scarcity, then what we do is that we uh, miss the other very important vital parameters like technology or affluence that also play very important role in environmental change or in environmental crisis. And on the other hand what happens is that this theory of eco scarcity that uh, actually tries to blame you know underdeveloped uh, countries or so called third world countries like India, because here the uh, growth rates of population and absolute numbers are uh, highest and compared to the you know the uh, so called developed parts of the world like the United States. But that this particular theory or this particular explanation is lopsided and faulty that it has come out very well in this particular table. Uh, designed by 
the World Resources Institute. And the title of the table is also very exciting. Uh, it is like, who is overpopulated? So you can see, you know, they have tried to assess the, so it's a kind of a comparative assessment of per capita consumption of resources and also generation of waste. And you can see how, you know, uh, the per capita consumption of resources of countries like India with uh, more population is much less than per capita consumption of resources of countries like United States, where the demographic uh, pressure is much less than, you know, some of the South Asian or African countries. So, this table, it points out, it clearly shows and indicates that, you know, uh, the arguments or the propositions uh, embedded in uh, theories like eco scarcity does not hold, uh, uh, you know, ground uh, today. So, with this, I uh, will now come to the five theses of political ecology, again, uh, which has been uh, proposed uh, by uh, Paul Robbins uh, in his uh, particular book on political ecology, a critical introduction. Uh, so, I will try to explain uh, this uh, uh, thesis uh, one by one. So, the first one is degradation and marginalization. So, what is explained here is environmental conditions, more importantly degradation and the reasons for changes in environmental condition. So, environmental conditions and reasons for changes in environmental uh, conditions focusing on of course, degradation. So, it says that environmental degradation long blamed on marginal people is shown in its larger political and economic context. So, we had discussed this uh, in the earlier slide as well that you know, uh, so the brunt of burden fell on the third world and its population because uh, the eco scarcity theory tried to prove that uh, these people uh, were responsible for you know environmental crisis, uh, but then we could see that this is actually wrong because uh, the marginal people uh, should not be blamed for environmental degradation because this is not a proper way of looking into things. Rather, it is important for us to understand and explore the larger political uh, and economic context. We need to uh, know uh, about technological choices of a society. For example, we need to know about you know uh, uh, several other factors like affluence, uh, greed, etcetera. So, these are the things that need to be taken into consideration. Otherwise, you know uh, uh, I mean uh, only blaming the marginal people, it would not be right or it, it would not be uh, an appropriate way of understanding or looking into uh, degradation of or degradation of environmental conditions. So, this is what uh, uh, this is all about the first thesis of political ecology, followed by the second thesis, which is conservation and control. This is also very important. So, it talks about what, what is explained uh, in this thesis uh, conservation outcomes, again, failures. So, uh, what are the outcomes? The outcomes most of the times you will see that you know uh, these conservation efforts, uh, they, um, they had actually they had had uh, extremely catastrophic and negative implications for uh, the ecology as well as social livelihoods. So, I will explain this uh, by saying that, so first let us look into the relevance of this thesis. So, uh, I mean uh, Paul Robin says that uh, conservation and control, they are generally viewed as benign efforts at environmental conservation are shown to have pernicious effects and sometimes failures result. So, um, I mean uh, this way of looking into these as benign and uh, you know uh, and uh, extremely beneficial uh, is actually uh, an apolitical approach. So, if we really want to perceive it or understand it by using the political lens, we will be able to understand that conservation uh, you know approaches or conservation initiatives, they are extremely thickly loaded with political and economic imperatives of, of the implementing body. For example, the statecraft. Now, I would like to give an example uh, using the Indian context uh, in this regard, because if you remember that. Uh, during the colonial times, Dietrich Brandes, he came up with a particular uh, uh, theory, uh, which is called the theory of scientific forestry or scientific management, through which for the first time Indian forests uh, were actually uh, some of the forests were declared as reserve forests. So, what happened is that they said that why they wanted to reserve uh, these Indian forests, because uh, in order to protect them. 
But then, uh, so what happened is that immediately, you know, the forest uh, villagers, uh, they were not allowed to enter into the forest, they were not allowed to access uh, the, the timber and non-timber forest uh, produce. So, the forest resources became extremely, you know, enclosed. Now, what had been the outcome? So, did that, did that really protect Indian forests? So, if we see statistics, if we see data, we will find out that that was the period from when actually deforestation or failing of trees increased at an, you know, at an intensified pace. So, what was happening was that the, the, the trees were used uh, to, you know, construct railway lines, the trees were used for the shipbuilding industry and all that. So, we need to really understand that, you know, this conservation and control mechanisms, these are not, you know, our political initiatives, rather they are thickly loaded with political and economic imperatives of rule or statecraft. So, next coming to the third thesis, the third thesis is the thesis on environmental conflict and exclusion. So, what is explained? Access to environment and conflicts over exclusion from it, that is from access to environment. And the relevance is that it explains that environmental conflicts are shown, uh, the, or environmental conflicts are part of larger gender, class, and race struggles, and vice versa. So here, what happens is that the uh, the ecology is politicized, and uh, politics is ecologized. So you can understand the greater, uh, the deeper relationship between environmental conflicts and the social parameters, the social dimensions like gender, class, race, etc. Okay. So, coming to the fourth thesis, it is all about uh, environmental subjects and identity. So, identities of people and identities of social groups. So, political identities and social struggles are shown to be linked to basic issues of livelihood and environmental activity. Of course, and this is extremely, this becomes relevant, you know, within the context of South Asia, for example, because in South Asia, we will find that, you know, environmental protection and the sustenance of social livelihoods, they are complementary, they are, uh, they are intricately uh, interlinked, okay. There is a, there is a strong interrelationship, there is a strong interaction between environmental protection and sustenance of uh, community livelihoods. For example, if we um, take uh, the uh, what happened during the Chipko movement in India, or even the what happened during the Narmada Bachao uh, Andalan, uh, so where you know Medha Patkar and several other leaders they were you know uh, they were uh, protesting against the construction of the dam, they're protesting against the implementation of the Sardar Sarovar project on the Narmada River. Then what happened is that they were actually protesting against the uh, the you know the the um, uh, they were protesting against uh, not only the dam, uh, but they were protesting against the faulty policies that would actually affect or that would cause social disruption. So, even like when the Chipko, uh, in the, during the Chipko movement, the tribal people, they hug the, uh, they hug the trees. So, why were they hugging the trees? Because their intention or their purpose, were, were, I mean to save the trees was that, that if these trees uh, 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 would be cut, then what would happen would that from the next day, they would be having, uh, you know, survival problems, because their livelihoods, their occupation are directly related to the environment, to trees. Similarly, you know, uh, if uh, a dam is constructed on a river, then uh, that can create uh, uh, floods and uh, during the pre-implementation phase also, uh, land would be annexed uh, from the villagers uh, due to the, uh, uh, you know, construction project and all that. So, these are all directly related. So, in India, you know, when people uh, protest uh, or if you see the nature of these new social movements, you will find that people were uh, protesting not only for nature, for nature's sake, but nature, you know, for the sake of human beings, for the sake of their very own sustenance. So, the final thesis, it is all about political objects and actors. So, here you know the material characteristics of uh, the non-human, uh, you know the non-human world uh, like uh, including uh, rivers, water, uh, um, lawn, grasses, vegetation, etcetera. So, they are entwined, they are absolutely entwined with the, with the world of human struggles and uh, political ecology make us aware about the interconnection between uh, these two. 
So, these are the very five fundamental theses uh, of uh, political ecology uh, you know uh, that are very important because uh, when we uh, need to pursue political ecology for example, when uh, you know social scientists they pursue political ecology of water uh, all these five theses are somewhere embedded in their understanding uh, of you know uh, in their understanding or in their um, explorations of particular case narratives or particular field findings. So, so now once we know uh, about the framework, once we know about the particular framework of political ecology as a whole, now it will be easier for understand or focus uh, into uh, specifically focus into political ecology of water. So, political ecology of water uh, I mean it has come out as a critical uh, literature focusing on and analyzing the uh, social and political dimensions of water. So, we already know by now that you know uh, that water uh, should not be abstracted or water cannot be abstracted from the local, cultural, political and social dimensions. So, political ecology is that critical literature that help us analyze the social and uh, political dimensions of water. And it talks about the intertwined and uneven flows of water and power relationships. So, as I mentioned earlier also that political ecology is a particular framework which explicitly focuses on power asymmetry, which explicitly focuses on power relationships. And uh, yes, uh, like uh, uh, recently Floor, Lafayette de Michoud and Christian Kull, they, they did a comprehensive you know they did a comprehensive coverage uh, uh, on uh, 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 relating to the uh, literature that is available uh, on political ecology of water and they pointed out that uh, there are or uh, there could rather identify three major trends within political ecology of water. So, the first trend is the philosophical trend that actually um, raises uh, questions relating to the status and ontology of water. Uh, followed by the uh, you know political uh, trend uh, that act denounces uh, capitalism uh, that and that denounces uh, uh, social injustice and that also denounces uh, all you know all kinds of uh, anti democratic measures and initiatives and finally uh, they talk about the applied trend uh, so which uh, you know make uh, the researchers or which make people uh, aware about the inherent uh, biases and contradictions uh, prevalent in uh, various water management uh, and for that matter also water governance uh, discourses and practices. Yes, so Johnston again I talked about Barbara Rose Johnston and there is a there is a comprehensive outline of uh, you know uh, human dimensions of water scarcity. This is a particular uh, quote uh, which actually or uh, uh, which actually uh, clearly brings out the human dimensions of water scarcity. So, the which clearly brings out you know that uh, scarcity is political, scarcity is manufactured, scarcity is uh, manipulated. So, and it also talks about not only you know the importance of considering uh, quantity and quality aspects or components of water, but at the same time uh, being aware of the questions relating to entitlement and access. So, this is a comprehensive uh, quote that says that water scarcity not only reflects the relative aspects of supply. So, so water scarcity not only refle reflects the uh, relative aspects of supply, the conditions and actions that affect quantity and quality and demand that is the intended and projected use, but the relative aspects of how water is valued. So, the cultural meanings associated with water, the economic values associated with it, plus relative levels of access and patterns of use, plus relative degrees of control over water resource management and distribution. So, scarcity might reflect the economic ability to pay for water or the customs, social conditions and relationships that privilege access to some while withholding access to others. This is the most pertinent you know uh, statement that th this last phrase that you know the, the relationships that privilege access to some while withholding access to others. So, who are the gainers, who are the losers? Who are the, uh, I mean, so who are the beneficiaries, who are the non beneficiaries? These are the crucial questions that we really need to be aware of.
Yes. So now uh, coming to uh, you know exponential growth versus ecological uh, sustainability. So uh, I mean the challenges that we are uh, facing today are this outcome of the uh, what is going on uh, you know uh, are these outcomes of natural uh, events like uh, global warming, climate change, etc., or they are also the outcomes of economic development. So, this is also a very important a crucial question, because if you understand that in the last few decades, you know economic development and urban growth for example, they have been responsible for, for, uh, the, for the you know conversion of almost uh, half of the wetlands uh, all around the globe. Plus, they had also been uh, responsible for uh, for you know uh, loss of loss of uh, fish and loss of other uh, ecosystem. Uh, I mean, loss of uh, several ecosystem services. Uh, if we just take the example uh, of one particular country, for example, if we take the example of China, we'll find out that you know uh, in China, uh, more than hundred uh, water bodies and wetlands had perished in the last few years. And uh, you know, uh, seventy percent of uh, the uh, water bodies uh, and wetlands uh, that are still there. So the 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 quality has deteriorated so much that uh, these uh, wetlands and uh, they they have absolutely become uh, dump yards of uh, you know industrial uh, wastes and effluents. So again, coming to the question of development for whom and uh, what costs. So, and at what cost? So, this can definitely be uh, explained and exemplified by the example of uh, dams. So, uh, since the uh, post second world war period, uh, more than 45,000 dams have been con uh, constructed across the globe, you know, as per the report of the World Commission on Development. Now, uh, we all know that dams have been constructed uh, to produce uh, hydroelectricity to irrigate uh, paddy fields and to control the uh, flow of water uh, in rivers. Now, but the question is, uh, uh, I mean definitely we find whole lot of differences between uh, the official projections or promises and actual realities. So, we will find out that you know, uh, you know dams had been uh, have causing uh, massive floods, uh, uh, severe ecological and social disruptions in most of the areas and uh, like uh, 5 percent of uh, world's fresh water uh, uh, they just get lost to transfer uh, evaporation uh, from these reservoirs. On the other hand, these res reservoirs are also responsible for emitting almost 28 percent of greenhouse gases, which is 4 percent of the total uh, CO2 emission and also one fifth of human related methane emission. So, these are some of the crucial statistics and figure uh, that we need to keep in mind. So, on the other hand, uh, as I had mentioned that uh, it, it had uh, led to severe uh, ecological catastrophes like floods uh, and uh, also droughts and uh, it had uh, led to disruptions in social livelihoods. So, indigenous uh, people and also more importantly women, they had actually suffered uh, but the cost of this big uh, infrastructure, the cost of these big uh, projects. On the other hand, they had been absolutely excluded from the benefits of it. So, it is very important, it is very crucial this particular question that development for whom and at what cost, who are the gainers, who are the losers. So, this is the most crucial question within political ecology. So, coming to the last leg uh, of the lecture, so I would uh, also like to focus on that much of this political ecology of uh, water has actually focused on what is known as uh, potable water. So, potable water uh, that is uh, water utilities, uh, pipes through which water actually flows. So, much of the political ecology of uh, water literature has focused on uh, this uh, potable water. And
and uh, uh, emphasizing on uh, urban infrastructures. So, uh, political ecologists they had uh, looked into the uneven uh, distribution mechanism that produce uneven water skips. So, at the core of the whole uh, discussions, I mean at the core of the discussions had been the choreographies of power that influence how much water flows through urban infrastructure. So, how much water? So, the quantity and where it flows. So, these are the two cru crucial questions that political ecologists had been engaged with uh, while studying portable waters in uh, some of the most important cities that how much water flows through urban infrastructure and where is where the water flows. So, uh, who determines that where these pipelines would be constructed, who determines that which households or which neighborhoods would be uh, allocated what amount of water. So, these all these questions of distribution, the question of allocation, the question of construction, everything is thickly loaded with you know it is thickly loaded with uh, uh, politics, it is thickly loaded with uh, economic and political decisions made by uh, the state, the statecraft and of course, in association with private companies and several other uh, stakeholders who are also involved in this entire power game. So, this is what uh, political urban political ecology of water is all about. And Baker, current Baker, uh, he uh, says that for the urban elite, water supply is often relatively abundant and relatively cheap. For the urban poor, the scarcity of portable water is a daily hardship. And this is quite prominent. We had given the uh, Kolkata example. I can give you several other examples from several other uh, cities of the world where uh, this particular thing that you know water being cheap for the urban elite and water being you know uh, uh, scarce uh, for the urban poor is an absolute and an inevitable reality. So finally, like uh, you know, uh, while political ecologists uh, they used to mainly concentrate on the quantity of water. Very interesting, uh, you know, uh, studies today are also coming up. Uh, so far as uh, water quality is concerned, very recently one particular article uh, has been published in uh, the Geo Forum. It has come out in 2017 by Ruska. Uh, and our colleagues, and there Ruska talks about uh, you know he uh, talks about the complex interdependencies uh, among power, politics, uh, uh, physio, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, chemical and microbiological contamination of water, and uh, he talks about uh, at the same time parallelly he draws our attention to uh, the. Uh, to the to to uh, water contamination or the uneven uh, distribution of uh, water contamination within uh, centralized networks and on the other hand you know uh, how that leads to a lot a whole lot of inequalities within the urban waterscape so uh, finally if we focus uh, into the South Asian or more specifically the Indian context, uh, we'll find we'll be amazed to know that uh, this uh, third world uh, urban water political ecology is emerging as a very vibrant field. Many researchers, mainly coming from the discipline of history, coming from sociology, coming from anthropology, and even some natural scientists, they are conducting uh, you know uh, uh, water research by uh, using the lens of urban political ecology. So, uh, f f uh, for example, few examples uh, that I have uh, put here. Definitely, we need to know about Amitabh Bhaviska's work on uh, Delhi. Uh, I mean, Amitabh Bhaviska's work focusing on the city of Delhi, where uh, she has focused on uh, River Yamuna, and she has shown that how this River Yamuna has actually transformed from a uh, non-place, uh, you know, uh, from a non-place, uh, no-value uh, thing to a real estate priced commodity. So, how this shift has uh, happened in the imagination of the municipality and how different stakeholders like the middle class, the state, the poor, how they had perceived this change. So, she has uh, de uh, discussed this in detail uh, in her work on the Yamuna river in Delhi and she has also shown that how uh, this has created uh, a, you know, a whole lot of uh, uh, problem uh, relating to uh, entitlement you know, and deprivation among the different social uh, stakeholders in Delhi. Similarly, Sundaresan uh, has focused on the lakes of Bangalore, 
Coelho and Raman, uh, again a fascinating study on the um, urban land and urban water bodies in Chennai and they have shown uh, that how you know these water bodies sometimes you know uh, they are perceived as uh, lakes in making, sometimes land in making, sometimes as resettlement sites, sometimes as dump yards. So, so many identities for this urban land and urban water bodies uh, suiting uh, or keeping in tune to the political economy imperatives of statecraft. So, Mukherjee, uh, myself, I had worked on like uh, the blue infrastructures of Kolkata and using a historical uh, political ecology of uh, water framework. I had shown that, and this is the diagram, you know, which talk, uh, shows the sustainable flows between Kolkata and her peri-urban interface. So, how you know Kolkata uh, and her PUY, that is uh, peri-urban interface, in the form of the East Kolkata wetlands, uh, around like 12,500 hectares of wetlands. How Kolkata, how the city and the, uh, the peri-urban interface in the form of wetlands, they are mutually connected to each other. So, and but I had shown that how you know this uh, this uh, relationship it evolved during the colonial times. So that has a long history, which I will cover in one of my uh, lectures, where I'll be mainly discussing you know about empirical findings from case studies. So, but in short, like I'll, I, I I have shown uh, in uh, this case study that how this uh, mutually interdependent relationship is now transforming, unfortunately, into a truncated relationship due to uh, due to rapid urbanization and urban sprawl uh, that is taking place in the contemporary times. So, finally, Cornea, Zimmer and Rene Veron, they had focused on the pondscapes of Bardhaman and Singh, Neha Singh, uh, she has uh, focused on uh, changes uh, in the urban waterscapes of Vidarpur. So, what I will do is that I am going to provide you with uh, the, you know, uh, the all these uh, papers uh, or, or all these book chapters and journal articles if, and if you can go through these book chapters and journal articles, you will find, uh, you know, fascinating accounts of the complexities surrounding uh, uh, you know water bodies or waterscapes uh, in these different Indian cities. So, that would be an exciting venture uh, by itself I guess. So, with this uh, I would like to uh, finish political ecology of water and uh, these are some of the references which uh, would be shared with you. So, that you can have a detailed understanding and explorations about the nitty gritties of realities covered here. Thank you.